the people who actually who are more worried about concerned about privacy are precisely the people type of people that use the digital experience more. So what does that mean then? What is the nature of the privacy paradox? Really, it says that there's two kinds of the welfare related to the data from customers' point of view. One is that they want their privacy to be protected. The other one is that they want to share some information to get service, get better services. So we have to satisfy both needs. That means to deal with the issue of privacy is not to lock down data. Because if you lock down data, you, don't, you refuse to exchange the, your information, you don't get the service, you're out of the society, out of a lot of economic activities. Mm -hmm. So the right mm -hmm. approach then is to, is to encourage the data exchange. But in the meantime, we protect the privacy in this process. This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Dr. Wang Chen, the Director of the Luhan Academy, and who's been with me as a guest once before. Today we're here to talk about a fascinating new report that the Luhan Academy has put out in conjunction with many famous economists, including Mike Spence, Brent Holstrom, Patrick Bolton, uh, Chris Pissarides, Eric Maskin, and numerous others. At any rate, uh, Dr. Chen, thank you for joining me. The name of your report, Understanding Big Data, Data Calculus in the Digital Era. It came out in February. Uh, it's available on your website, and it's, an ex in my own reading, it's an extraordinary report. I would encourage all kinds of people who think they know what's going on with big data and its influence on society. Everybody will learn from reading this report. It's very fresh, very deep, very thoughtful. So congratulations, but please tell me, what inspired you to bring this, to, this report to life? And then what did you find in doing so? Well, thank you very much, Rob, for your kind words. Um, I think we, we globally, we, so a lot of people, we, we care we understand data plays a crucial role in the digital age. And so, but in the meantime, people are increasingly worried about their privacy. And so the, the question is, how should we, uh, so there are several uh, reasons that kind of motivate us to write, write this up. Uh, people are worried about privacy, but then they don't, and they feel they're losing control of their privacy and they want to control it. But on the other hand, we see there's a lot of power and a lot of digital benefits out of using the data. Uh, so we need a good way to understand what is privacy anyway, and what is the, uh, what is the, the nature of data. But let me start, I think that about a couple of years ago, we, at Lohan Academy's annual meeting, we had this debate about the privacy related issues. And so we have some uh, guests uh, from Europe and their opinion is that uh, uh, people's privacy were somewhat invaded on the platforms because they had no choice. So that actually motivated us to, to study what people would do if, if they do have choice. And there's such a mm. thing called privacy paradox, basically, and it's really globally in every country, you can observe that uh, people, when you ask them, do they care about, worry about privacy? And almost all of them will say, most of them will say yes, globally, in any country, um, including China. But then they turn around kind of to publish a lot of stuff about themselves uh, to you know, a lot of information, personal information, seems to look like they don't care much at all. So this is the kind of paradox. Now, some people claim that that's because they have no choice. Let's say you are on Facebook. You, you kind of, your old friend or your friends on, on that, you cannot just take yourself off, off it. So you kind of, you are forced to do it. But then that is strange. If you think about that, there's billions of people who actually do exactly the same thing. They worry about privacy, but then they, they share a lot of information. So mm -hmm. it comes down to what is privacy and what is information? What is the benefit of information and data? 
And unless we put things together, uh, we won't be able to understand what's going on. And it's possible that we might even hurt the users in the name of protection, because there, there seems a clear need for them to share information. Another thing that motiv uh, motivated us to write this report with some of the best information economists is that uh, actually, uh, now, nowadays we call this thing data, but in the old days we call them information. And uh, so information economics, in a sense, is the data economics in this age. You know, it's, it's really the, very similar. So we've been thinking about the value of information for a long time. And so many economists, uh, many authors in this report, they won Nobel Prize because of their deep thought about the role of information. And for a very, very long time, the efforts in theory and in practice is to overcome the obstacles to the block information, obstacles of asymmetric information. So we've been promoting spreading information for a very long time because we realized that's one of the crucial thing that separates human being from animals. But then uh, somehow now we, we care so much about the downside about spreading information, personal information. So then, uh, so in a sense, we have to, of course we care about privacy, but we need to understand the value of information and data. So in a sense, we have to borrow the old lessons, the principles we have learned uh, by so many economists who have spent so much time uh, and so many institutional arrangements trying to, that are made to overcome the, the asymmetric information. So we have, we're trying to bring all those things together to, help us understand the, the nature of data and privacy. And so that sometimes uh, reminds me uh, of Peru. It's called, uh, I think it came from India. It's called the, um, the elephant and the blind man. Uh, what it says is that uh, once, once upon a time, there were, I think, five, six blind men. They were first for the first time, they were led to an elephant, and people asked them, "What what what does the elephant look like?" And one of them touched the trunk, and they feel like elephant is a trunk. Some another uh, guy uh, touched the ear of the elephant, and feel like the elephant is really a fan, a big fan that can wave around. And some another one touched the the body of the elephant, and he feel like the elephant is really a wall, and so. Of course, in a, in a sense that uh, they're all right, uh, but uh, unless you put things together, you really won't, don't, won't be able to understand what is an elephant. In a sense, I think data is like that. So that, uh, that motivates us and it's been an interesting journey. So we, we were working together to try to understand what is the nature of data and what is the nature of privacy and how should we deal with it to take the best at leverage on the strengths of digital technology and data, but in the meantime, we can protect the privacy and other stuff well. Hmm. Well, I'm curious about one dimension. When you talk about, say, the person on Facebook who puts things on there, uh, is, the, is the problem that they don't know what would be done with that information? In other words, if I'm tailoring what I want to put on my page, if I know everything you're going to be doing with it, I can exercise my own judgment. But if I think the only people seeing this are my 12 best friends from high school, but in fact, all kinds of other people and agencies and others are seeing it, then perhaps I'm not conscious of protecting my own privacy. So uh, I guess where do you want the locus of responsibility to be? Should it be with the person who joins a system or puts their data on? but knowing where it's going to go, or should it be, how do I say, something imposed from above, like by a government agency or whatever, about what I'll call the rules of fair play? How do, how do, how do you see that architecture working? Uh, so I think we, first thing we need, probably needs to remind us that uh, there has been a long tradition that we, we, we share personal information in the public. And I'll give you one example is the yellow page. In the United mm. States, for a long time, for, for, for more than 100 years, in 
most cities and towns. You can get the uh, the name, address, and telephone number from every family in the town. So mm -hmm. we are very, very used to uh, share information. And because uh, I think for a long time we realized that uh, it's very crucial for everybody to be connected to the society if they trust the society. And uh, and uh, some another angle we can, I can think about is the economic activity. So a lot of time when we think about economic activity, we think about trades, we think collaborations. But actually beneath that economic activity is the information flow, is the exchange of information. We have to know each other. Uh, a producer has to understand the preference of the customer to serve them well. This is a basic. Mm -hmm. I have to mm -hmm. give the supplier information such that they can give that can give me the service, provide me stuff. So, so really beneath any economic activity, activity, so long as it is beyond two people, uh, more than two people, then we have to exchange information. So that I think has been going on uh, for, for a long time. And that's why uh, I think as a society, uh, for people, they are, we are used to exchanging information. We've always been doing that. We're making a lot of arrangements to spread information. But uh, it comes down to, I think, uh, of course, this other side is the privacy. It, it comes down to what you feel comfortable or you do not feel comfortable. And so, and so in most circumstances that we do feel comfortable, but sometimes uh, it might be abused in some way. So I think it's the, uh, that's why, uh, that's why if we goes back to the, uh, go back to the 1970s, when the FIPS, it's a fair information uh, practice standard, when it came out from in, in the United States, essentially it asks the, how to uh, make good use of information. So if that information is uh, being used uh, by, by some other people, some other institution, but, uh, so long as you set some boundary, for example, you have to acknowledge them, uh, you have to somehow get some of the approval in general. This is, you set the boundaries, but otherwise I think uh, exchanging information is essential and we are, we've been used to it for a long, long time. Well, you do a very nice job early in the report of tracing essentially the history of economic thought about information with Hayek, the Coase, Ronald Coase, famous for the Coase theorem, the people like Stiglitz, Akerlof, and Spence, who shared a Nobel Prize focused on asymmetric information, and, uh, and many others. But you also talked about something you called the three Vs, velocity, variety, and volume of information. Can you describe a little bit uh, how you came to frame it in, with the three Vs? In, in how does that encompass what you're trying to illuminate? Yeah, so we've, we've been trying to promote the flow, the exchange of information, as we just mentioned. And so those uh, economists, uh, information economists, they spend a lot of time thinking about how to overcome the problems of blocking the information. But mm -hmm. what's special in the digital age is really is make the, make the data digital so that can be easily produced, exchanged at very, very little cost. So that's why we see an explosion of the data and information ever since the digital technology uh, mm -hmm. more than half a century uh, uh, ago. Now, so, but if we want to describe the, what's the nature, it's, it's still information, it's still data. What, so what changed, I think that's the three Vs we're trying to use to describe it. One is the volume, that's the big data, the size, you know, the amount of data we, we, we are using. And uh, then the second is the variety. So there, there's so much more information that can be recorded, observed, recorded, and can be exchanged because they are all digitized. Uh, so that's the variety. But I think the, the last thing, which is really, really crucial, but people uh, kind of underestimate its power is the velocity. Uh, the, 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 the speed we're producing uh, uh, information is like the, it's instant. So that means as we have a lot more instant ability than, 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 than before. 
Uh, one one example maybe is the let's think about is the is the car is the new car that's the Tesla and the, in other country in, in China it's coming up. So uh, if you think about the type kind of explosion of the information, uh, now if you have a thousand cars, if the if you have the uh, you have the uh, if you drive it without driver, you know, so if you use the AI, it drives by itself. So amount of information it can't produce a day. It's kind of somewhat equivalent to one year's search amount of information in China uh, through Baidu, which is China's version of the Google. So that's really explosion of information. And we use those information instantly. That's the velocity size. So you can see it's the variety, it's the amount of information volume and the uh, an instant, uh, a timely uh, uh, nature of that, using that, that distinguishes this age from the industrial age. Yes. I remember just uh, as I'm listening to you, I was inspired at one time uh, when Ben Bernanke was the chairman of the Fed. There was a group that included Google, credit card companies, and so forth, because he was saying he has to make decisions about the course, the trajectory of the macro economy. But the data from the US employment reports and so forth is compiled and comes out something like 45 to 60 days after the time of, of what was being measured. And so the credit card companies and the search engines and so forth started looking to see, and they, they kind of said, we could replicate that awareness with great confidence 72 hours after it happens, we can put something on your desk for the Federal Reserve Board. So instead of waiting for six or eight weeks, you waited for three days to feel like you understood what the state of macroeconomic vitality was, whether you were ahead of the curve, behind the curve, what have you. And they also could do things that gave you a much more textured sense of region rather than national aggregation by zip code or county or congressional district. They could see the variations, they could see by sector. And I just remember listening to Bernanke talking one evening about, like, he felt like, the way I think he described it was like, we went from the era of radio to the era of television. All of a sudden <laughs> I could see the economy, whereas I was just dreaming and guessing with long lag times beforehand. And obviously, the, to him, that was a, a great benefit. And uh, I didn't see any uh, way in which the Fed was snooping on an individual's credit card account to see what they were buying. Uh, they were pulling the aggregate information together to have a much more uh, sensitive and timely understanding. And I, I, just, I imagine there are thousands of applications like that. And the data, just like you described with Tesla, the data is getting faster and better, more variations. And uh, so I, I, I find this fascinating potential. And perhaps if people understand your report, they might be more conscious of what the boundary should be so that they don't eliminate this potential. On the other hand, maybe officials become more mindful of where the danger zones are for violating personal privacy. And uh, you, how do you say, you're, you're allowing us with this report and the findings to go on a trajectory where we can get more from data and be less scared. And I think, I think that's very productive. That's a very constructive uh, thing to offer to society. Thank, thanks so much for your, for your kind words. But let me uh, follow up what you said. Um, precisely, uh, so you mentioned the, the risk, financial risk. So, and that is something uh, we're, we are really seeing this in, in China. Uh, so uh, in the, fi in the uh, financial sector, sometimes we talk about the credit risk. So essentially, uh, we, if you think about a bank, it lends, it lends the money. And, but then the, the bank, uh, uh, you see, it's kind of static in the sense that uh, whether the, 
the 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 borrower will return the money back, you won't be able to see much after at, at least there was uh, after several months. But nowadays, there's so much more real time daily data uh, when the economy is being digitized. So actually, you can track credit risk daily. So that mm-hmm. really changes the definition of the risk management. Uh, traditionally, we think about what we think about. Wow, we have to understand the probability of default and the loss given default. Since those kind of concept, but those kind of static, you're assuming there's a stable distribution. Then there's nothing else can do it. So you're gonna have some reserve to to prepare for that. But how about you can't know much more real time what's going on the risk. You can actually change your risk. You can change your risk exposure, change your products. So that changes the whole dynamic of that thing. So I'm pretty sure Benanki would be much more much happier had he mm-hmm. had those uh, tools. And that's precisely du- during the 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 uh, the COVID nineteen uh, in in early twenty twenty. Actually, in February 2020, we actually at Lohan Academy we actually use the use the big data to construct a daily uh, economic activity index across China, and so that covers more than 300 regimes. So we actually can, can track the economic activity daily, and that's and overall it's very uh, precise. And uh, then we extended that globally to many more than I think uh, 190. A country and regions. So why do we do that? Because as you, many people can can experience now. If you want to recover back to work, now should we speed up the recovery or should we contain the 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 virus uh, the, the 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 COVID first? If you as restart slowly, then people uh, get hurt financially, economy gets hurt really bad. But if you speed speed up too quickly, then the, the COVID-19 is coming back. So we have to strike some kind of balance because they are mm-hmm. really going up the directions. Now you need some kind of measurement to see how we kind of know every day how the COVID is spreading because we know how many people get uh, kind of uh, uh, unfortunately died or have you know, also, so uh, confirmed cases, but then we do not know enough about how economy is suffering daily. Mm-hmm. So that combination mm-hmm. is something uh, my expense and, uh, and, and us work with us, we, we call this the pandemic economy yeah. because we have to combine the two sides to make the, the right decision. The first thing I think I want to remind is that's something we, we feel interesting um, uh, in, in the report. So, so as I already mentioned that there, ha- there has been a very long tradition uh, for the human beings, societies to spread information sharing. But now we care much more about privacy. So what exactly is the trade-off? And we, I mentioned that it's the, there's this privacy paradox. So people in every country worry about privacy, but in the meantime, they share a lot of information. So what's going on? Now, uh, sometimes people say, well, maybe people in China do not care about this much about privacy. And that's why the digital uh, 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 the the digital spending is going up. China is leading the world in in the uh, e-commerce, for example. Mm-hmm. It's uh, e-commerce mm-hmm. accounts for about uh, uh, twenty-seven percent of the retail sales in China in uh, mm-hmm. in China's economy, which lead, leads the world. So, and China has transformed itself into a mobile-based country. So sometimes people worry about uh, care, uh, since suspect that maybe Chinese do not care about privacy. What they do, actually, we, we had a survey. It's more than 90 some percent of the people say they, they really worry about privacy. So human beings are the same. Now the question is, what exactly the nature, the thing of they care about, do they really care about? If they do, why do they share data, personal data? So sometimes then it comes down to the, another argument that says that maybe they, that's because they have no choice. Uh, that's like if you are on Facebook or maybe it's the, in China, if we are on WeChat or, or, or Alipay, it's, it's a big uh, app. Then if you don't use it, that, that's really a trouble. So that's why we did this. I think it's one of the largest scale. Uh, it's a big data on big data. It's one of large scale 
experiment and uh, the test to see uh, what people would do if they do have choice. So in this particular setting on Alipay, so we have more than 800 million users. So it's a big app now, but so in a sense that you don't have a choice, uh, it's kind of, you will, your life will be inconvenient if you don't use it. But then on Alipay and like in uh, many, many other apps these days, we have something called mini programs, which is kind of the temporary version of the app on Alipay, so it's app on app. Mm. But those apps, you can see that we have uh, hundreds of thousands of those apps, and some of them are very young, new apps. Some of them are very mature, big service providers. So each of them, when on Alipay, when it pr kind of prop up to the, to the potential users, they have to ask their approval. You have to tell them which kind of information uh, are you willing to share? If you want to willing to share, you can get this kind of service, things like that. Uh, so it's like a restaurant, okay? If you mm -hmm. want to use that order in the restaurant, you are there. But then you have to tell me some of your information, you know? So we have kind of connect to you so to so know, you know you are really going to pay the money later, things like that. So are you willing to do this? Well, if you do not, then you just pay cash. So that's okay. But then you, you, people might want to do it. So there's a lot of apps. Uh, the, uh, there's a huge variety of those apps, and so they vary by their necessity. So you can choose not to use it because some of them are kind of trivial. Some of them are essential. They also vary by the information sensitivity. Some of them ask for your some kind of your in financial information, your credit score, uh, your your address, some very uh, more private things. Some of them ask very general. It's just your 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 name, uh, your nickname, things like that. So the, the, the vary by the necessity, by the uh, sensitivity of information. Then on the other hand, we have people vary by their risk aversion, how trust, how, how much trust they want to place on those apps. So that becomes one of the largest uh, scale of the study how, on how people, when they do have choice, how they're going to trade off. And so we have some interesting findings. For example, we find that about uh, three quarters of the people, uh, they when they first time pop up, they are going to accept the, those service, and they don't really care as much about whether it's a new service or it's some some name, the big names, the trust, or some new apps. They're going to try it, three quarters of people. So, mm. and and then later they actually they seldom regret because about. 0.1% of the people will kind of the, uh, delete the app, you know, so the information later. Uh, so it's very small. So that means they don't really regret. So uh, fascinatingly, this is very consistent with what we observe in Europe, United States, and uh, globally. So there, there was this uh, privacy index uh, uh, study. So that, uh, that conclusion is also about uh, three quarters of people, they're kind of, they're willing to accept the data to, uh, to the, the kind of pragmatic regarding how much they want to share the personal information. So, and so that's very consistent. And also about in the both United States, Canada and Europe, about one or two, 0.1, 0.2% 0 .1, 0 people, they, leak, they log off, you know, they kind of they re refuse to use those apps later. So you can see that, so that means uh, people don't really regret. We also find that when people use, they have more digital experience. So sometimes we suspect that that's because they don't know they, they, could, they could be cheated, uh, abused. But then we actually find that people, so when they have more digital experience, they actually are open, more open to use them. So mm -hmm. that really, the, the bottom line is this. And that we actually had did a separate academic study uh, with my friend uh, Wei Xiong, and uh, uh, at his student from the um, Princeton and with a couple of fellows at the mm -hmm. Lohan Academy. What we found yes. is that the people who actually, who are more worried about, concerned about privacy are precisely the people, type of people that use the digital experience more. So what does that mean then? What is the nature of the privacy paradox? Really, it says that there's two kinds of the welfare related to the data from customers' point of view. One is that they want their privacy to be protected. The other one is that they want to share some information to get 
service, get better services. So we have to satisfy both needs. That means to deal with the issue of privacy is not to lock down data. Because if you lock down data, you don't you refuse to exchange the, your information, you don't get the service, you're out of the society, out of a lot of economic activities. Mm -hmm. So the right mm -hmm. approach then is to, is to encourage the data exchange. But in the meantime, we protect the privacy in this process. So that's mm -hmm. the one thing we, 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 we learned. So that naturally us prop us to ask the question, there must be, there must be a lot of the benefits in uh, sharing information. So what's the value of data anyway for, for us to share? So we also look at the empirical evidence or kind of summarize going back to the literature of the information economics. Essentially, essentially we can say that you know, three types of the, um, uh, benefits from sharing information. One is the connectivity. So nowadays you can really connect to people from very far away. For, for example, traditionally any small shop, uh, their customers come from around within uh, 10 uh, kilometers because once further, there's no trade between them. So that's called the gravity model. It's like the longer the distance is very smaller gravity. But then nowadays on a typical uh, uh, trading platform, I think in the United States, maybe Amazon or the or uh, uh, eBay or in China at Alibaba. The, on Alibaba's platform, the average distance between the buyers and sellers is about uh, a thousand kilometers. So that gravity mm -hmm. model is essentially is gone. So that, mm -hmm. but that really reminds of the, the, the power of market. So the power of market is to let more people to participate to, so that we have specialization or improve the productivity, etc. So, but then if you do not have information, uh, then <laughs> this will not happen. So connectivity means opportunity. Uh, so nowadays as a lot of the, so on Alibaba's platform, we have like more than 10 million SMEs. They're serving uh, hundreds of millions of people. And so, and so for those entrepreneurs of SMEs, half of them are women. Uh, so they, they, they would never have opportunity without the digital uh, platforms and without some kind of exchange of information. And so, uh, so that means opportunities. Now, we also try to ask the question, so what happens if the, sometimes we said, okay, you can connect, but you don't need much of my information. But now another interesting thing is, you see on the platform nowadays, you actually, for the, uh, for the customers, it's very hard for them to choose. For example, on Ali, Alibaba's uh, Taobao, you have more than a billion items, uh, commodities. How are you going to browse through them? It's impossible. So you need recommendations. So a natural question is what happens if those recommendations do not contain any personal preference? We don't, do not know anything about you. So we did a natural experiment here. So we kind of shut down a huge number of the of users uh, when doing the recommendations. Uh, we shut down their personal preference. So the recommendation is based on the industry trade level kind of data. It's the standard data. You can see that those recommendations quickly converge to the uh, top 1% of the brands. So the kind of more general uh, standard, like what we are used to in the in the industry age. Then you can see that the then the actually the sales, the browsing just dropped by like 80%. So it's shocking. So because customers do not find those recommendations interesting, and especially those SMEs, the smaller uh, the brands, the small brands, they were hurt most. So you can see that's the power. But anyway, so that's the part of the connectivity and the value of the based on personal information, and though it also help us to to be smarter as as we know. And then finally, it, it builds the, a trust system. So on the typical platform, you can have the uh, hundreds of millions of the users, you're going to have the tens of millions of the merchants and every, the, every part of the service uh, of the products and including those SMEs, they will be ranked, they will be rated by the customers. By doing that, they build the trust system as if uh, they have hundreds of millions of people that are seeing each other uh, uh, directly and the, 
And that really overcomes the traditional lemon problem like Akla uh, worry about mm -hmm. uh, because there's no information, there's no trust, there's no market, there's no exchange, there's no economic activity. You can see those things. But let me stop here for now. Maybe yeah. one ask well, this, These are many, many interesting things here. You know, I think about the fact that I use search and if the search knows that I'm 64 years old, I just took up surfing. Uh, I'm a beginner, or this, you know, all these kind of things that it'll help me buy a better life jacket or the kind of surfboard that can support my height and weight, and all these kind of things. That how would I say? It would take a lot of going to stores and asking questions and a lot of time to learn the same thing that can be distilled very quickly. So I can see how by revealing myself. I can be helped by these services. And so I guess the nature of what you want to keep private, you have to be conscious of when you're playing with these powerful tools. But, yeah. I, but there's huge advantages. But let, let me, that's just kind of a reflection. If you see more uh, nuance to it, please share with me. But the other piece that I think is also very interesting is, and you were kind of alluding to it, the structure of markets, does this information power, this aggregating power and everything else foster highly concentrated large monopolies who then can be monopsonists or monopolists and extract wealth in ways that a more competitive marketplace couldn't? Or is there something that says all kinds of small firms can participate because they can reach so many people over a broader footprint beyond a thousand kilometers and now they can play at scale through the access to these platforms and that, that creates a more competitive marketplace so it used to be the guy down the street who knows that you can't afford a car can raise the price on your groceries now if you know you can order them and have them delivered from nine different places there's a competition there so I, I'm just curious where the balance is on this question between the power that leads to monopoly platforms and uh, extract, extracting of rents either from the suppliers or from the buyers, and on the other side, facilitating a more competitive marketplace. Yeah, so you see, if we only discuss this theoretically, we can discuss this for a very long time without a conclusion because they all sound right. Uh, but then, uh, but they, if, so that's why we have to respect uh, uh, reality, uh, empirical evidence. And uh, then that we can see that it really varies by country and by industry. So we have to yeah. acknowledge this. We don't pretend this one way has to be true. But now let me give you some examples, for example, in China. So in China, you see, we uh, Alibaba is a typical example. Uh, Alibaba, I think about five years ago, it still uh, uh, accounts for about 80% of the of e-commerce e market because it has the first mover advantage. But then mm -hmm. it has come down to about 50%. Uh, it's really, uh, to, uh, it's, going down uh, uh, very steadily. So that's one example. Another is like what I, uh, I'm used to is the Alipay. Uh, so it's the mobile payment. Alipay was the first to, because of e-commerce, it took off first in China. It's looked, took, it has more than, again, 80% of the market share, but now it's down to a lower than 50%. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, another, uh, so mm -hmm. if, if, if think about the, another one uh, player is the, uh, TikTok, uh, people in the United States are kind of very familiar now. Uh, TikTok and it took off it uh, very quickly. And another one is the, it's called the Pindodo. Uh, it's e-commerce. It actually took this company only about four years to accumulate uh, more than uh, four, 400 million uh, new users. Uh, so what we really observe really is that your power, presumably the dominant power is fading quite fast. And if we look at the history of the internet to nowadays, really, I think whoever claim it's a big data, 
it's actually dying very fast in general. And I, there are very few examples. And uh, so, so my point is that the, I think the competition is dynamic. A lot of the uh, advantage are transient. New technologies are coming up. And if we ask how come the big data doesn't necessarily lead to winner takes all, because really if we think about data is really one dimension of the, of the, of the business model. Uh, so, but when you uh, compete, you're competing uh, based on your products, uh, your business model, how much you can satisfy your customers. And so that combined with a lot of new technologies coming up. So it's very dynamic. Now I acknowledge. So, and also another interesting things about the data is that uh, I think uh, the, the power of data is not, there's a very uh, there's a big limit. For example, there are studies actually that found that the, 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 the advantage of data do not last more than let's say half a year. Uh, so, so it's not like you, if you have a thousand years of data, you're going to know the human being so well, well you're going to ser serve the customer better. Actually, you do not. You, what really mm -hmm. starts is that you have a new product. People like it. So you have some kind of data to understand how much they like it, how, how, how much you can improve your product. You serve it even, even better. So that can take off. But then there's a limited how long of history of the data you're going to use this. And uh, normally it's, it's no more than one year. So the bottom line here is that if we want to understand how data or big data is contributing to the, to the competition, we have to acknowledge that it is getting more and more important. Uh, we have to use, make good use of it to understand your customer. But that doesn't mean you're gonna dominate because there's numerous examples globally to show the opposite that you seemingly to have the first mover advantage, you presumably build some data. Somehow it doesn't really lead to your dominance for a long time. But I also acknowledge that because it is one dimension of the competition, then that it is getting important so that it is possible in some industry it can uh, become more concentrated. But in many industries, it's definitely not the case. And finally, mm -hmm. I think especially on platforms, because if, if you have to look at which kind of platform it is. Now, if it is a platform that connects the, the suppliers with the customers, the platform actually has a lot of incentive to promote that connection, to use the data to empower the, the demand side and supply side, including SMEs. So, and that's why I think we really need to, especially in the digital age, we really need to promote that everybody to participate in the, to get the benefits of the sharing the data, especially for, for the SMEs to get that benefits. We, when, when, we talk, when we think about the digital divide, one of the big divide is information divide. So we really have to empower the smaller average Joes small companies, startups, to get things, to get the, the digitize, digitize the business infrastructure such that a new startup that consists of only several people, they can serve the, serve the customers a thousand kilometers away, they can prosper. So I think it has the both side of this. I don't think that hypothesis of witness takes away is general, but it does happen mm -hmm. on the dice downside too. We really need to promote the innovation and the more inclusive side of the market structure. I'm coming and listening to you and I'm thinking about how the information got much more fast and perfect and transparent and costless. But now I'm seeing that if I were setting up a hedge fund today, I would be looking for people who were very sophisticated in analyzing big data to find which companies to invest in. And when you said that moments ago about the data is only good for about a year, you really got to become gifted in diagnosis and pattern recognition in big data whose half-life is very short. But I imagine there's some people that are just beating the market by leaps and bounds now because they've mastered the kind of skills that you're describing. 
are inside of the knowledge systems of, that these new technologies offer. Um, yeah, so yes or no. So um, I think there's, uh, there's huge benefits of using the, uh, the three V of the information. Mm -hmm. uh, not only the volume, but really the variety and the uh, instant part of this. But mm -hmm. in the, so it's in practice, uh, I think this is, this is really crucial. Uh, what we're really observing is that it's really changing the business models. Um, now the business is much more customer driven, uh, so-called mm -hmm. C2B, customer mm -hmm. to business, because now mm -hmm. you have so much more instant uh, customers response. Now, so that's why when, when you have the new uh, R&D on the, your products uh, upgrade, revision of your products, it's much more customer driven. You have much more connectivity. Mm -hmm. So business models are, are, are really uh, changing uh, because of instant uh, quality and risk assessment. What I was well, observing in China, I look at on financial, uh, they, they are doing things because of the, the, the variety of the data. And so, uh, so those are the things uh, we, we are doing. But I, I, I'm not exactly sure in the, let's say, in the capital market, in the secondary market, that uh, the, I, I, there are very few hedge funds that can brag about the big data. Maybe mm. they don't know enough about it. I don't know, or, but, uh, yeah. but yeah. I, I, I observe very few uh, hedge funds or the funds, they claim I'm big data funds, but actually they are making uh, a super profit. So I think that's still very elusive and, uh, and, and challenging. Yeah. Well, I'm going, going a little bit further with what you're saying, I remember I worked with a very brilliant man at Soros Fund Management named Stanley Druckenmiller. And he said to me, we have to study what the world thinks. Then we have to have our own idea that differs from that consensus. And then we have to understand the process by which they will come to understand that we're right and then prices will move. And I think what you're, all, you're saying partly is this data is so fast now, the, the volume and velocity parts are so fast that you gotta be real quick to diagnose what's going on because the time when people who also understand these systems will catch on and change their view is, right. is much more rapid than the old days, which makes it harder to capture that arbitrage. But I, I do wonder if there aren't people who are mastering the use of these platforms in a way, but they can't be as confident that everybody else will catch on because they know not everybody else knows how to use these information systems. So they may have to be patient, take longer time horizon, or understand structural things that will not reverse or be just transient in order to make money. But uh, I, I would imagine there are some young, very smart computer scientists who might become very good hedge fund managers in the years to come. Yeah, I, I think I, I always suspect that, I, but it's, not, it's coming uh, slower than I thought. But what we're observing more generally, I think, is that uh, in a lot of the business, many of this, a lot of sectors, nowadays we have to, we have the opportunity to get better use of the, of the big data, the data we're having. And on platforms, we can see that those kind of the data services are coming up, make it the use of that more, much more inclusive. So mm -hmm. if we do not think too fancy about those things, it's really about the uh, the uh, average company nowadays they have so the, the kind of the the cost of the start starting a business becomes so much uh, lower nowadays because instantly they can connect it to uh, globally you, if mm -hmm. you think about it. and if mm -hmm. they have good products and they have a lot of instant response and this is were not not imaginable like the 20 years ago so I think the, those are a lot of things that are happening and make us uh, very excited. When you work through data, the inspiration has come through stimulus provided by patterns, puzzles, anomalies revealed by the systematic gathering of data, particularly, quote, 
when the prime need is to break our existing habits of thought. So what you're doing in this report is breaking down what I will call the echoes of past patterns of thought that came from a different structure. And this structure has to be looked at with fresh eyes and with the data to illuminate what is happening. And that, I thought that paragraph described the essence of the gift that the Luhan Academy and you and your team are giving us all. Well, thank you again for your, your kind words. So, um, indeed, so a lot of time uh, we, we cannot distinguish what is our, we believe is what really are seeing, what we are worried about, and what we really can understand. So we are really affected by what we are worried about and our experience. Uh, or inspired by that. So I think if we really want to uh, understand things, we really have to uh, respect uh, the evidence. For example, privacy. Uh, we, Of course we care about privacy, but really it's what's the nature of privacy? And we, mm -hmm. if we observe everybody's what's, what's going on, what do we exactly, how do we share information, then we see that we share information all the time. And in, in the meantime, we'll care about privacy. And so those are something. And for example, ownership. Sometimes we feel like, well, for example, let's say, Rob, we, we are talking to each other. This fact, does that belong to you or does that belong to me? The fact is that it, it belongs to both of us. And we actually mm -hmm. have a different version of information. For example, I probably noticed that uh, you wear glasses, uh, you have, uh, you have mirror in, in background and uh, you might not observe what's going on in my background. So we actually, so that's another, uh, the, the nature of the data of information that mm -hmm. it has this non rivalry thing. It can be, mm -hmm. can be produced and reused unlimited times without consuming the, the subjects, the, the us here. So mm -hmm. that means there's a lot of the different version of the ownership. So that also means that it's not about define who owns it because it's an unlimited version of it, but it's really more about how to properly use it, how to not abuse the information. So we really need to understand the, uh, the value of the, how data, the, where does the value come from? It comes from exchanging from the, and it also, the, the, the proper way is to protect it in, in, in right way. But anyway, so there's a lot of things. Um, it goes beyond our uh, uh, instant, immediate uh, concerns. Then that that requires us, especially uh, serious econ economics uh, uh, serious. So they mm -hmm. it's very because it's very easy to come up with a beautiful model, but with the wrong assumption, and you and and you are trying to use the mathematics to come to convince the world I'm right, but really sometimes it's terrible, and so. Mm -hmm. So we need needs to have the academic uh, rigor, but really, that's going back to the the Rona course, uh, words. As you mentioned, we we need to be inspired by the by the re, by the reality. Well, as you said at the conclusion of your forward, when these new things are coming onto the radar, may, many people are afraid. Many of people are afraid of change until they become acclimated and see its possibilities. But what you say at the end is you don't want to dismember the goose that laid the golden egg. And I think the prospects of this platforms and technology, particularly for the emerging countries, which can constitute a profound transformation in Southern Asia, Africa, Latin America, we don't want to dismember that goose. And I think that you and the Luhan Academy, I can say at INET, we're very proud to work with you and we're very excited to learn from you. And we're very interested in, how would I say, how your insights can particularly be applied to the people most in need and who are suffering most on this planet. So thank you very much for the work that you do. 
we're in a partnership with INET, and uh, I look forward for, for many future episodes to continue to learn from you. Thanks so much.